Hi, I'm Jerry Boyer. Welcome to Meeting of Minds podcast. My guest is Derek Kreifels, who is the CEO of the State Financial Officers Foundation. Derek, welcome back to the program. Hey, Jerry. Great to be back. Thanks for having me again. Well, I'm looking at your annual report, the 2022 annual report, um, and I, I've been following what you've been doing, and we've had interviews before, but it just kind of struck me all at once how how you have been used, you and you, the State Financial Officers Foundation and your members have been used in powerful and, I, from my standpoint, I think from a lot of people's standpoint, unexpected ways um, in the last year uh, to work against the politicization and ideological capture of finance. So I'm looking at some of these highlights. Five billion dollars have been divested from BlackRock by your members. Five That's billion right. with a B. You want to tell with us a, a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean it, it's uh, it's great. You know, we provide the the right information uh, to to allow these men and women to make decisions that are are the best for their state. Um, and and it was great to see you know West Virginia Treasurer Riley Moore kind of kick that off a year ago. Um, you know, since then we've had Arizona Treasurer Kimberly Yee divesting 540 million. Um, then Arkansas Treasurer Dennis Milligan divested 125 million. Um, it was like dominoes just kind of fell in line. September Utah Treasurer Marlo Oaks, um, uh, South Carolina Treasurer Curtis Loftus. Uh, Louisiana Treasurer John Schroeder, our national chairman, uh, divested almost $800 million. Um, in October, Missouri Treasurer Scott Fitzpatrick divested $500 million. And then November was the big one. Um, Florida CFO Jimmy Patronis announced a $2 billion divestment from the state's investment council from BlackRock, um, thanks to uh, his and, and Governor DeSantis' leadership. Hmm. And then, of course, um, I think because of all that and there were several ancillary activities and ways that we were pushing back. You know, um, Vanguard announced that they were no longer going to be a part of the Global Financial Alliance for Net Zero, yes. which we 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 claim that victory. That's huge. No, that, um, that, yeah, that's you. Very excited. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, you know, I think um, the pushback is starting to work, um, not only from the state officials, but now we're really starting to hear more of a groundswell I think of educated citizens, you know, they're still clearly a majority of Americans don't have a clue what ESG is. Um, but I would say that there are probably this 25 to 30 percent of active investors. Um, they're investing their own money that are clearly catching on to what companies like BlackRock and State Street and others have been doing, um, you know, through uh, state pension investment, through shareholder proposals. Um, and I think that they're starting to ask tough questions of their retail financial advisors, and and they're starting to move money around. Um, we're hearing numerous anecdotal stories uh, of of people that are you know moving half a million million you know five million dollars um, away from those companies and into companies that they feel like are just simply doing their job as fund managers, yes, uh, doing their sole fiduciary duty to, to get the best return for the investment period without any political issues. And that's what we want. We want these banks and these fund managers to stop playing politics with taxpayers' money, with pensioners' money. Um, we want them to stop being a part of this net zero climate action uh, cabal uh, that's led by Michael Bloomberg and other friends from Europe and the UN. Um, it's un-American, and we feel like it needs to stop. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I think that um, the big asset managers, um, and it, it, by the way, it's not just BlackRock. No, it's not. Um, BlackRock has a CEO who is in love with making political statements. They've got a yeah. CEO who is, who is unrestrained, who lacks an editor. Um, yes. But it is not just BlackRock. BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, and, and others. Um, right. are They're voting the same way. They're lobbying the same way. Um, it's good to see Vanguard at least making a motion in that direction. Now, of course, trust but verify, right? All right, right. Vanguard, we're going into a shareholder meeting season. Are you going to vote exactly the same way as you would if you hadn't pulled out of the alliance? I mean, pulling out of an alliance, all right, that's a nice symbolic move, and, and it is a victory. And I really I think it's a victory for your members in particular. 
Um, there are other voices out there, and that's great. Um, I'm one of them, but I didn't do it, and neither did some of those other voices. Your members did it. They put it on the yeah. agenda enough and got their attention. Um, yeah. So that you know, it's it's good that that you know we've got that, that attention, but we got to kind of keep an eye on them. Now, let me give you an opportunity to. Re- I'm going to give you a counter argument, which okay. I know you can easily rebut, which is. Well, BlackRock's learned their lesson, um, and they're creating other alternatives for, in, in, you know, for um, some of these big institutional uh, customers, so they can have an alternate to BlackRock's voting. Uh, so, you know, so they don't have to vote necessarily the way BlackRock says, and they're really not that liberal, and they're not that ESG. And we we've heard you. We we yeah. we, we at BlackRock have heard you, and we've we're responding, and we've fixed it. What's your response to that? I would say that we know that they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. Uh, what they're clearly communicating to the state officials uh, that they're meeting with on the ground is not the same message that we're hearing from from what like what you just said. Um, and and so you know at the end of the day, uh, time will tell. Uh, you know, I, I think. Um, as long as Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock, I think there will not be a huge change of direction because the guy likes to talk, likes to talk publicly, um, looks at himself as a as a world leader, um, even though he wasn't elected to anything. Uh, and uh, and so, you know, I, I think you're going to continue to uh, feel the pushback. You know, North Carolina Treasurer Dale Falwell in December called for Fink's resignation, uh, and so, I think rightly so. Yes. Um, and I think you're going to hear that uh, more. And, um, you know, we'll just uh, we'll continue to uh, kind of go down this path until everybody's satisfied that I, I think the other thing, too, that BlackRock does that's disingenuous is they're certainly pushing the companies that they're investing in, you know, to, to behave and perform a certain way. Right. Right. So while they may be, you know, trying to make things better for proxy voting for for shareholders and, um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, you know, they're still telling companies that are smaller that they want those investment dollars in, you know, how they're going to perform, whether it's, you know, a, a some kind of mass ag production company um, that needs to perform in a certain way to match some kind of methane mitigation environmental standard that they're setting. Uh, this is, again, this is a standard set by the government. Uh, this is BlackRock telling them how to behave and how to perform. Acting you know? like it is a government. Right. Acting like it is. And and, and frankly, you know, it, it's I, I think the other thing that we just we absolutely don't trust is that that that, you know, BlackRock is going to do this, you know, these Fox News ads, that warm fuzzies that they're spending millions of dollars on right now, which, again, we think is great that they're having to do this. Um it's disingenuous knowing that they at, at the end of the day, what they want is to do more business in China. Right. Um, you know, they're willing to look away from China, from their, you know, human rights uh, violations, from their their environmental violations. Uh, it, it's so hip, hypocritical of, of Mr. Fink as, as well as the rest of the company that, you know, I, I think. That's where people are fed up. I think it's it's not only the public side where you're seeing these leaders pulling money out, but instant, you know, retail investors, they've, un, they are starting to understand and they're pulling out of buy shares and they're, they're starting to move their money away from, from companies that are trying so hard to appease the communist party of China. Um, and look at the time we're in right now with all of our other issues surrounding China. Um, you know, in, in our minds, this is just another Trojan horse for China to come in. BlackRock's helping them. Plain and simple. Well, and they um, and they help them to the degree that they suppress energy production and make no, right. make no mistake about it. Fossil fuels is energy, um, by which right. I mean not just that fossil fuels is a source of energy, but that the alternatives are not capable. Uh, they're not realistic, grown up, you know, uh, um, alternatives to fuel a modern economy. Yeah, you could do a little around the edge with solar or wind, whatever. But but if you are outlawing fossil fuels, you're essentially outlawing the only viable energy source. Uh, unless well, you're going to go very pro-nuclear, which they're not doing. So uh, in essence, it's anti-energy. So, you know, who stands to benefit if America is hobbled 
by uh, the lack of energy in its industrial production. Well, the, the other largest economy in the world stands to benefit. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's a great new book out called Cobalt Red um, that I've just started reading, but uh, it, it does go into you know this issue of of mineral rights and, and international ownership of, of mines um, and the human rights violations. You know, there's slave labor uh, in Africa that is currently you know what is 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 how they're mining cobalt for the electric car industry. Yes. Um, so you know, I if if you feel a lot better about the environment driving your Tesla, you know, I I hope you feel uh, uh, as bad that you're you know, your, your Tesla was built on the, on the hands and lives of, you know, African children. Yeah. And it's interesting. I've poked a little fun at some of the um, left-wing activists, like the, as you so, who are, yeah. and, and some of the proxy services, which are always calling for disclosure of the supply chain, except cobalt and yes. except chromium, uh, which are known carcinogens. Um, yeah. Why? Because they're part of the electric vehicle. They're part of the process of producing batteries for electric vehicles. So because, they're, they, because they've bought in to the electric vehicle industry, we can't ask any tough questions about children with cancer from chromium and cobalt mining and slave labor. We can ask any supply chain issue uh, it, we want, but we, except about China or except about um, – electric vehicles. So that shows yeah. how not just political this is, but even more so kind of bought off by certain industries. That's right. And there, that that energy for those electric cars is still coming from somewhere. I mean, it, it's, it blows my mind the number of young people I talk to about, you know, using electric cars and how good they are. And, and then you ask them, you know, where does the electricity come from that charges your car? And they say, well, from the building right there, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> Um, and you you realize how quickly there is a disconnect uh, that that I think it's forty percent of that energy still comes from coal, um, and so you know it, it, it's just a huge huge oil issue. coal natural gas that's almost all of it right there they're right. all fossil fuels right um, right very little is coming from nuclear and and the rest of it I think there was there was an article in the Washington Post attacking um, Treasurer Allison Ball. Uh, for taking the position with these banks, which, which is if you are boycotting our our major industry, fossil fuels, then you can't do business with us. And the and the um, and she counted the number of jobs that you know depend on on this energy. And right. she counted cars and she counted electric cars. And the article kind of tripped her up. Ah, ha, ha, ha. You know, she's even counting you know green friendly electric cars. And it's like. What do you mean? You don't think these these cars run on fossil fuels? Of course they run on fossil fuels. Yeah, it's so ridiculous. Yeah, um, I guess when they don't, it doesn't pay for them to ask too many really tough questions, does it? About the, no, about their no. agenda. But you do, and your members are. All right, you've got a new um, program out. Our money, our values. That's yes. the website, right? Our money, our values. Dot com. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Dot yeah. com or dot org. It's dot com. All right. Our money, our values. Dot com. Is that about this ESG stuff? It is. It is. It, it's a result of uh, of us winning uh, the Heritage Foundation's Innovation Prize last year in 2022 that allowed us to kind of springboard that uh, into action. And, and really, the idea was um, that the only way to really make a true impact with an issue that is that can be as wonky as ESG investing was to really touch the hearts and the minds of Main Street Americans, that to really help them understand the connect between ESG and their pocketbook, their bottom line, you know, the impact of, you know, restrictions on fossil fuel leading to higher gas prices, higher diesel prices, which have led to higher, you know, logistical costs, which have led to higher grocery prices and, and more expensive eggs, you know, at the grocery store. Um, and so we've, we've tried to lay all that out. There's a great four and a half minute educational primer video on that website. Uh, there's a little 60 second version as well. But um, we launched that campaign uh, around December 1st. Um, we had over 32 million uh, hits on it. Wow. Um, we had 4 million views with, of the shorter video. Um, you know, we're just trying to get the word out. Uh, we've grown our, our Twitter followers and our Facebook followers, trying to use social media as much as we can, um, but really trying to help them understand kind of the impact of the bottom line. I will say this too. Um, one thing that we added to the site that is a, a, a kind of a we want to hear from you uh, part of the site 
where we're asking um, men and women who own small businesses and farms to share how ESG has negatively impacted them or their lives or their businesses. Um, and we're started to hear from a lot of them. Um, and, you know, some of the stories um, range from, you know, the mom and pop catering company that uh, happens to do business kind of aimed at, at oil field workers, providing, you know, meals for those workers um, and their insurance, their commercial insurance lender would no longer cover them because of their focus and mission focused on oil workers. That is Boston. egregious. It is egregious. Um, you know, there, there's, and that goes all the way up to, you know, the power company that has a fleet of vehicles. So, that so what, oil workers aren't allowed to eat? I mean, that's what that amounts to. <laughs> what, what are these? Pretty much. Yes. Yeah. Or, uh, or quit uh, their evil profession. That's and, right. And become what? I don't know, bloggers or something. That's right. Yeah. And, and we're hearing from farmers, too, that the hard part is, is that many of these, you know, the, the, the administration and the left have done a really great job of scaring people, um, of, of, you know, uh, pushing fear uh, and can the cancel culture. And so people are afraid to speak up. Yes, um, small business owners, they're worried that, that they're going to lose their business. You know, farmers are willing that, you know, they're, they're afraid that the EPA is going to be showing up on their front doorstep the next day. Mm. Um, and so, you know, we, we do have some brave men and women that are coming forward um, to share their stories, but we need more um, for all the listener, your listeners. Um, you know, we want to hear the stories and we'd love to, um, you know, if, if willing, share with the American people so that uh, all Americans can truly understand the impact on everyday Americans, um, on what ESG is doing. And I suppose someone could be anonymous too. They can tell their story, but not want their name used. Right? Sure. Yeah, right. And we get a lot of that. Yeah. Um, uh, we get, we, we get a lot of that right now. Is there some so, place where I can read those stories? Is that on the website or have you not? Pu- not yet. Okay. Um, we're trying to, we're, to, we're evaluating what to do with those next. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, you can only go so far with an anecdotal story where you can't really, mm-hmm. you know, attribute it to somebody's, you know, that you can, yeah. meet and talk to. Um, and so we've kind of debated about how far to push those out. The other thing that's on our um, on our, our Money, Our Values website that might be helpful to your listeners is a downloadable PDF, um, five questions to ask your financial advisor um, that we we borrowed from a friend uh, that's been talking about it. Uh, but they're, they're great questions to ask. You know, question number one, have I invested any funds that voted my shares in favor of racial equity audits? Hmm. Uh, question two, have I invested in any funds that voted my shares in favor of emissions reduction plans or executive compensation tied to environmental or social goals? Um, number three, have I invested in any funds that systematically underweight companies in any of the following sectors, coal, mining, oil and gas exploration, defense, or firearms? Uh, number four, do you use ESG factors in your external fund evaluation process, internal operations, or client portfolio optimization strategies? And number five, if the answer to any of the above questions is yes, can you please inform me of alternative investment options so that I may select funds and portfolios that best align with my own long-term financial interests? Mm, that's good. Um, so, and, and that's a mouthful, but uh, we made it a PDF. It's free. You don't have to sign up for anything to download it. Uh, folks can go on our website, uh, ourmoneyourvalues.com and download that PDF, the five questions to ask your financial advisor and take it and, and ask their retail advisor those questions. And that way, um, if they decide that, you know, they need to pull money out of a, of a fund manager that is uh, acting nefariously with their funds or, or operating in a way that is anything other than their fiduciary duty, aside from politics, right. um, they can do that. Yeah. I, I might, given what's coming up this season, we might want to add a question about voting for um, divestment from pro-life states, because we're going to see a lot of that. Absolutely. We saw some of it last year. We're going to see a lot of it this year, I yeah. might even put that that ahead of racial equity audits as, as something that would yeah. offend our sensibilities even more. Not to critique the document, but just to no, it's great. Our, our state financial officers are aware of that. You know, we watched TJ Maxx, Lowe's, and and Walmart. I think were the three companies that had the shareholder proposals last season mm-hmm. on those pro life initiatives. Um, you know, we clearly, with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, anticipated that that was going to go from three to one hundred and three, right. probably right. Um, this year. And we've already had one this year, Costco, and it went down in flames. It got, it it didn't get 40% of the vote. It got 15% of the vote. 
Wow. Um, and um, I, I, I don't know who might have talked to them, uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> I, um, ISS historically supported those resolutions. And we've had a conversation with ISS. They no longer are supporting those. And they recommended a no vote. ISS is the big proxy service. They recommended a no vote on, on the Costco one. Oh, that's great. Um, so I think they're feeling the heat or seeing the light or whatever is causing them to change their yeah. mind. Uh, maybe just sweet reason. Um, yeah. And so I expect we're going to have a lot of these this year, but I think people are going to be shocked by how poorly they do. Yeah. Um, they're not. They're well, not, you know, I, think I, I will say this, Jerry, about this. Um, you know, I've traveled a lot and I get a, an opportunity to speak at different events. Um, in the last few weeks, I've had the opportunity to speak to probably a dozen or so C-suite executives from mid-range to larger corporations, publicly traded companies. And they're, they're saying, thank you. They're saying, thanks for giving us uh, some leverage to say, Hey, we have pushback now on this other side. Of course they are. And I've noticed the same thing because when all the pressure comes from one side, management loses power. That's right. But if there's a counterbalance, then management starts to balance and they get some of that power back. Even liberal CEOs, I'm finding want conservatives at the table because they can't yeah. appease the left. The hard left will keep pulling and pulling and pulling, and they That's want right. the ability. I can't say publicly who it is, but there's a large energy company that uh, I'm working with an advisor who put a proposal forward, and companies almost always fight proposals on their proxies. They said, yeah. we're not fighting this. We want this conversation. It's a proposal that basically says everyone has asked you to to, to assess the risk of you know, being a, an energy company of using fossil fuels, we would like you to tell shareholders the risk of divesting from energy, from fossil fuels, you know, because there's risk as a trade off. So we want to hear the other side of the story. And they're that's saying great. that's a good debate to have. We're, yeah. we're not going to we're not going to ask the SEC to knock that off. We're going to have that. In many cases, they're welcoming the conversation because they need they need balance for their own purposes. Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. All right. So. um that that's what you were doing last year. Um, now this year, you've got a bunch of new members because apparently um, the politicization of finance, political capture, ESG, some people call it woke capitalism, whatever you want to call it, actually turned out to be a winning election electoral issue. And so people who are concerned about this did very well. So in a year last year that wasn't necessarily that great for conservative Republicans – in these treasurer and auditor general's office, things actually went pretty well. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, that's right. You know, it, it is interesting. Um, you know, we are a 501c3, and so we can't get involved in the election. So, we, you know, we're watching from afar. But the one thing that we noticed was there were several candidates that ran on kind of an anti-ESG platform. And in um, most of those cases, they, those candidates won. Mm. Uh, and in some cases, um, you know, beat incumbents that uh, in one case in particular had been there for 40 years. Um, I'm talking about specifically uh, Iowa State Treasurer Robbie Smith. Um, the new newly elected treasurer beat the incumbent uh, Democrat that had been, he was one of the longest statewide office holders in America. Um, and, uh, and, and we, you know, I think a lot of people were surprised by that. Um, but but that trend continued. We had uh, we picked up a seat in Wisconsin, um, where he was the only statewide that won, other than U.S. Senator Ron Johnson, um, uh, that was on the the Republican side. Um, you know, we uh, we picked up Kansas uh, uh, in Kansas Treasurer Stephen Johnson. Um, we picked up Nevada, uh, Nevada State Controller Andy Matthews. Um, there's some really great uh, folks that have that were elected that. We already had those member states like Dan Elliott in Indiana, Todd Russ in Oklahoma, um, Mark Lowry in Arkansas. Um, there's an up-and-coming uh, auditor, uh, Andrew Sorrell out of Alabama. Um, there's a great uh, senior um, auditor from Nebraska, Mike Foley, who served as lieutenant governor uh, for the last couple terms. And before that was state auditor. He's coming back to be auditor again. So um, just a really great group of folks and really joining this kind of uh, already existing group of state officials who are fighters. They are they are doers. You know, you and I talk a lot about action and getting things done. And these men and women are not 
about the talk. Um, they, they walk the walk as well. Um, they're fed up. They're not willing to be pushed. They're not going to be let, you know, be pushed around. They don't want to see their taxpayers pushed around, their retirees pushed around. Um, and so they're going to keep fighting. I think you're going to see a lot more this year um, come out, probably some more divestment announcements. That's good. Um, probably going to see, I would anticipate some of the model policy that we've been excited about um, that has translated now into legislative form in multiple states. I, I, I think you'll see some of those uh, legislative bills pass. Um, and, uh, and so I think there's going to be a lot more action this year. Hmm. Well, I, I think that there's a certain kind of person who runs for auditor general, a controller or treasurer, tends to be a workhorse more than yeah. a show horse, yeah. tends to be a kind of steward, uh, accountability, detail rather than publicity. Uh, it's not like a big ego stoking, you know, kind of job, right? right? right. Um, it tends to be kind of a diligence job. Um, yes. and up until recently has been fairly non-ideological. Um, right. now I know some of the folks on the left have said, oh, well, these people are politicizing finance. Of course, that's nonsense. These people are stopping the politicization of finance. If that's finance right. is politicized and someone says, stop, um, then, you know, they're not the ones who are bringing politics. They're yeah. the ones who are trying to expel politics from the financial decision. ESG sneaks politics in by trying to call it a finance theory. But it didn't come out of any finance department in the world. Um, no. You know, stakeholder capitalism came from a sociology professor. ESG came from the United Nations. Um, right. Up until this started getting pushed down, by, down on us by the political class, there was no financial... Um, center expert that I know of in the world who was looking, you know, for an ESG agenda. Now, of yeah. course, some people have signed on to it because there's a lot of money flowing that way, and there's a lot of virtue signaling, and you can save the world. And some of the lar some of the biggest checkbooks in the world are associated with it, but it doesn't come from finance, and that's because it isn't finance. It comes right. from politics, and that's because it is politics. And yeah. your members are saying politics is fine. We run for elections just like everybody else. But between elections, we're, our, our responsibility is a fiduciary financial responsibility and nothing else. And I want to commend them and you for the work that uh, you're doing. Anything else you want to talk about before we go? Or did we cover everything that uh, um, you wanted to cover, my friend? I, I think we've covered. You know, I, I think the, the thing I would just encourage listeners to go and, and check out that Our Money, Our Value site. Um, follow us on Twitter for breaking news. That's where we break news first. Um, at SFOF underscore states um, and, uh, and, and follow us there. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, you can find more information about SFOF at SFOF.com. Um, frankly, we're looking for, we're looking for donor friends that can help us amplify our, our money, our values campaign. We have more videos that we've produced that we're ready to launch. We just need the financial support to do that. Um, so if folks want to do that, we would be extremely appreciative. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's my honor to really serve and represent these men and women who are really the ones that are in the trenches fighting and putting their political necks on the line every day. Uh, and it's an honor and blessing to be able to do that. That would be a high impact donor effect uh, because yes. you guys are not highly visible, but you're highly effective. So donor dollars go a long way. That's right. They do. Derek Kreifels from the State Financial Officers Foundation. Thank you for being our guest again on Meeting of Minds podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Jerry.